at that. You believe God can do anything? <laughs> Five of you. <laughs> Here's the reality. God can do anything you can believe for. How many remember a man comes to Jesus with, a, with his son who's possessed of devils, and you know what he says? He said, Lord, if you can do anything, help my son. You know what Jesus actually says to him? He says, it's not about whether or not I can. It's whether or not you can believe. He actually says to him, if you can believe, all things are possible. What was he saying? It's not about my power to work. It's about your power to believe. What are you ready to believe God for? We just sang, oh, my God, you can do anything. That's absolute truth. What are you ready to believe God for? What are you ready to believe God for in your life right now? What is it that your, your heart cries for? I'm excited. I feel good this morning. I'm going to go ahead and preach. Is that all right? We were extremely quiet in worship today, I noticed. That. So we're going to get things cranked up because I feel Jesus in the house. I feel really good. Uh, we are in, can I say a couple of things really, really quick? Thursday night, we had prayer in here. Um, we had prayer Thursday morning and Thursday night because it was National Day of Prayer. Over 100 people came. I think it's awesome when 100 people come together for a prayer meeting because we, we need to do that more. We're actually going to try to do some of that quarterly rather than just once a year on the National Day of Prayer because I think Jesus said something about my father's house being a house of Oh, you guys read that. Okay, <laughs> good. Do you ever notice in a service, on an, it, like, like we do two-hour services or roughly close to that, but we'll do an, uh, uh, like, like 50 minutes of, pre, of worship, and then, then we do announcements, and then we do about 45, 50 minutes of preaching, and, and we, in the midst of it, we only have about seven minutes of prayer. And Jesus said, my Father's house should be called a house of prayer. We, we, we've got to get back to being a people that pray. And, and, and there's something about praying at home, but there's something about corporate prayer. And we're, there's a real heart cry for me for that. So I hope everybody's hearing me right on that. But, but I thank you so much for all of you that turned out. We had an amazing time. Jesus showed up in the house in an amazing way. It was really, really heavy. It was a good time. Jason was leading worship in the evening time. And it just rocked. Jason and Tosh just brought it. And it was just a really, really good time. I, I, I want to see more of that. I'm, I'm excited for that. I think something happens when God's people pray. Ian Bounds actually says God does nothing but by prayer. How many believe that? Yes. Come on, man. James said you have not because... You guys have read the book. All right, yeah. Okay, it's in there. So good stuff. I'm excited. You feel good? Good. Let's go after some stuff. I want to talk to you today. It's Mother's Day. So, so I'm thinking about empowering women. Here's the deal. The Bible's full of heroes, right? There's a lot of heroes in the Bible. There's not a whole lot of sheroes in the Bibles. Sheroes. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? They're just heroes that are women. Sheroes. Okay. So, but 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 when I started thinking about some of the incredible women of the Bible, one came to mind in particular, and it's a woman named Deborah. Okay. So I started thinking about the story of Deborah in my in my mind, and I thought, man, I want to preach on Deborah because she's pretty amazing. She's actually a, a prophetess and a judge, and, and she's actually one of the few judges that, well, I think maybe the only judge that didn't have some kind of condemnation in her life. All she got was accolades. There's two chapters dedicated to her, Judges chapters four and five. And I started thinking about that, and then I realized the end of the story gets a little gruesome, but we're going to talk about it because there's a woman named JL who's going to be involved as well. And I want to talk to you about these two women and some things that God spoke to me about. Is that all right? Okay, you're going to get with me today. We're going to go after this. Okay, so, so go to Judges chapter 4. Let's just start right there and I'll just jump right into this. I'm going to talk to you about some things that are just stirring in my spirit. Is that all right? I feel good. Judges chapter 4. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron. And 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. Okay, everybody see this? Now, Ehud slew, slew Eglon. I preached on that in the fall. Remember that Eglon was a big fat guy and Ehud snuck in and actually slid him with a dagger. Does anybody remember that? Because that was a pretty cool message actually. Okay, so, so it was like, it was like, it's like Old Testament espionage. Okay, a little James Bond action right in the Old Testament. And so what happens is when, when, when Ehud, he goes to reign as the judge in Israel, and you know what happens is he leads the people of Israel, his entire life he keeps them in line with the Lord, right? But as soon as he's dead, you know what happened? A spiritual void took place. And they began to go back to old ways and old mentalities. Why does that happen? 
Because when we put our faith in people, we set ourselves up for a downfall. There's nothing wrong. Please hear this. There's a place where we give honor to whom honor is due. Does everybody understand that? There's always a place for that. There's always a place of giving honor. There's always a place of, uh, of respecting and honoring. But we can never put people on pedestals that were designed only for God. That was better. I'm preaching better than you're receiving right now, but that's okay. Because, because there's a place where we just have to understand that, that, that what happened is they, they, trusted, they trusted he had to lead them. And then what happened when he died, they felt like they were lost. Well, they, there's so many people, and I want to say this, and I'll try to be a little bit careful, but the truth of the matter is, is there's a place where we have to be able to realize there are people that can lead us to God, but we have to have personal responsibility to walk our walk. You've got to have a personal responsibility to walk your own walk. Like, thank God for moms and dads and spiritual moms and spiritual dads, and it's Mother's Day, and thank God for praying mothers. But the truth of the matter is, there's an old phrase that said, you can't get to heaven on mama's apron string. What's that say? You've got to have your walk as well. Is everybody okay? So, so when, when he had dies, there's a spiritual void, and, and they're, they're kind of stuck, if that's the only way. They fall back into disobedience. They start to seek their own ways. They get turned over to a guy named Jabin, okay? And he's one of the kings of Canaan. Because when you, when you walk in a place of disobedience, there always comes with the consequences. So for 20 years, they're faced with the consequences of their disobedience. But it says something that happens. It says, for 20 years, they're oppressed, and then they cried out for deliverance. It never talks about they cried out in repentance. They just cried out for deliverance. Sometimes when we find ourselves going through the tough place, we're asking God to get us out of the tough place when we haven't really examined what was the route that got me into this tough place in the first place. There's a, there's a, there's a saying in the world that says there's a reason for everything. And sometimes the reason is we're not too bright and we make bad choices. <laughs> And if you've, and, and what happens is there's consequences that come with some of that stuff. And in the midst of that, they made bad choices and they fell into this place and they're asking God for deliverance whenever they, maybe they should have been crying out in repentance and saying, God, deal with the root of my problem rather than just the problem. Well, I hope that made sense to somebody. So they cried out. Why? Because they're horribly oppressed right now and there's problems. And, and, and it talks about this. Can I talk to you a minute? Because it says Sisera is the guy who's coming against him. He had, what did it say, 900 chariots. Do you understand that in their, in their day, in their culture, 900 chariots would have been like 900 pans or tanks? Right? And, and Israel's got no weapon against this. So there's a challenge here that is way beyond the natural. I hope that makes sense to you. Okay? So in the place of that, watch what happens. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, Lapidoth, I'm sorry, she judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to, to her for judgment. Everybody see it? Deborah is now the judge. Anybody find it interesting that Israel has a female judge? You should see the stuff on the internet about that. Oh my gosh, we'll just leave that alone. <laughs> okay, but, but, but she's a female judge who has stepped into a place. She's got a calling on her life and she's a prophetess and a judge. Everybody see that? Now, the name Deborah means bee. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Anybody remember a guy that ran for president a couple years ago named Mike Huckabee, good spiritual man? Mike Huckabee's a good guy. If you read some of his stuff, he's a pretty good guy, okay? So accolades to him. But he actually said something that's not true, but, but I'll share with you what he said. He said, studies have been done on the bumblebee, and scientifically it's been proven that the bumblebee cannot fly. However, because the bumblebee never read the scientific facts, he still flies. <laughs> and they say that because of the mass and the wing size and, 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 and the way that the, aerodynamically it wouldn't even work, you know, but, but there's a whole lot of other things that they didn't bring into account, and I won't even get into all that. But the truth of the matter is, is that here's the deal. Somebody told the bumblebee, you're not, you're not made to fly, but you know what? The bumblebee realized I was created to fly. 
Oh, I want to talk to somebody. The world might have told some of you ladies, you weren't made to rule. But I'm here to tell you something. If God sets you in a place to rule, you rule. There's a whole lot of stuff out there that says a woman can't do this or a woman can't do that. And the church has placed a glass ceiling on women that God never placed on women. And he calls you to rise up. And there ought to be a roar inside the ladies of the house who are able to say, wait a minute, I know what God created me to be. I know who God created created me for and I will stand in my place and it's okay I, I, I look at Deborah a prophetess and a judge and I think how'd she get into that place of judge but there's a place where God elevated her and it says all of Israel came to the palm tree of Deborah how many understand when they judged in Israel, listen, when, when you were a judge in Israel, you know where you sat? You sat in the gates of the city, right? But she didn't have to go into the city and sit in the gates. They came to her. She had an anointing on her life. There's something about that that speaks volumes to me. When you have an anointing on your life, you will draw the attention of the people around you. And, and I'm convinced that God has something, something in store for us this morning. Let's just, let's just walk a little bit farther with what this is all about because to me it's pretty amazing. I think about this. She, 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 she is now in a place where, where Israel is being oppressed by Jabin, okay, Sisera and his armies. But God begins to move. Look at the next couple of verses, okay? Verse 6, just, just follow with me. And she said, she called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, has not the Lord God of Israel commanded saying, go and draw toward Mount Tabor and take with thee 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulon. And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude, and I'll deliver him into your hand. Jay God. What happened? The prophetess just got a prophetic word. She got a word from the Lord. So she calls Barak, who's the general of the armies, if you would, and she says, listen, God's about to deliver Jabin and all of his armies into your hand. And here's what you need to do. You need to go up toward Mount Tabor, go down by the river. When you get down by the river, God's gonna lure him in, and when he comes in, we're gonna take care of all this business. That's a good word, unless you're Barak, <laughs> who's scared to death of Sisera. Everybody follow what I just said? But she's got a word from the Lord. Now, what I want to challenge you with is this. Sometimes God will give you a word that will stretch you. Can I say this? If you get a word from the Lord that doesn't stretch you, it probably wasn't from the Lord. Oh, you didn't hear me. <laughs> Come on. God, I, I will say this. God challenges all the time to go beyond what would be seemingly natural for us, right? Because if I could do it in my own strength, I wouldn't need him. But if I can't do it in my own strength, but he's called me to do it, it's probably because he wants to flow supernaturally through my life. I challenge you to think of the places where God has stretched you through. Can you think in your life of certain things that you felt like there was an anointing on your life to step into, but you had fear or doubt or reservations because you didn't feel equipped and God was still pushing you and you stepped into it and saw it come to pass? Why? Because it wasn't your ability to perform. It was your ability to trust that mattered. God challenges us to trust him. So, so what happens is Deborah challenges the general and says, come on, we're going down to the river. This is what's going to happen. You go down to the river, take with you 10,000 troops, okay? That's a pretty big army. How many remember that when Gideon, when Gideon went to go, how many did he take originally? Do you guys remember this? He took 10,000. God said it's too many, right? So he cut it back to 3,000. It's still too many. Cut it back to 300. That's when Gideon's army prevailed over the Philistines, Right? Why? Because God was moving in that direction a, a whole different way. For this time, God actually said, get me 10,000. Doesn't that seem strange to anybody? But here's the deal. He's going to lure Sisera and 900 chariots down to the river. And how many know, Sisera ain't bringing 900 chariots if you only got 300 people. Come on. God wants to wipe out Sisera's army and all those that are with him, but it's going to take about 10,000 guys to lure them in or to draw them in because God said, I'll draw them in and then I'm going to destroy them. So if you start to look at this from that perspective, it shows us what God's doing. And what I love is that for at one plan, watch, 10,000 was too many. And in another plan, 10,000 is just enough. Why? Because God doesn't do the same thing the same way all the time. 
Sometimes when God gets moving in our life, we try to remember, well, how did God do this before? It doesn't matter how God did it before because he might just do it completely different this time. Everybody okay with that? Come on, who's been there? I remember the first time I prayed for a blind guy and he got a sight. Right? That was a pretty exciting thing. So you know what I did? When I went to pray for the second one, it was a lady. When I went to pray for her, you know what I was doing? Trying to remember the words I said on the first guy because it worked. How many know that all you're doing is making a method? Then you're not Pentecostal anymore, you're Methodist. Never mind. Okay, so <laughs> I'm just messing. Okay. But, but God's not about methods and programs and all that kind of stuff. God's about faith. Everybody okay? So watch. We don't want to get into, into formulas or methods. Okay? So here's what's happening. God's beginning to work in this thing. But here's, what, here's where we get to. And Barak said unto her, if, you go with, if, if thou will go with me, then I'll go. But if you don't go, I ain't going. Everybody see it? It's really what he said. Come on, if you go, I'm going. But if you ain't going, I ain't going. Why? Because he knows where the anointing of God's at. The anointing is on this woman. He doesn't feel qualified. And he's a little challenged. One of the things that I'll share with you is this. In that moment, understand this. Deborah got the word from the Lord. Barak got the word from Deborah. I challenge you because they're under an old covenant and you're under a new covenant. When somebody gives you a word from the Lord, it ought to confirm what you're already hearing in your spirit. And if you're not hearing it, maybe you need to set that word on the shelf till you pray and see what God's saying to you. In the old covenant, the prophet had to come down off the hill and declare the word, right? Come on, the prophet got with God and then the prophet came and he said, thus saith the Lord and the people responded just like Moses was on the mountain. Moses, you go and hear from God and then come and tell us. Everybody okay? Right? But in your, in your covenant where we're at today, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. That means you, as a child of God, have the ability to hear God for yourself. Doesn't mean that a prophet can't speak into your life. On the 18th, Tom Stamen, incredibly prophetic ministry. On the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, David Wagner will be with us, one of the most seasoned prophets on the earth right now. Amazing man of God, excited to have him with us. All these things will be happening, and I love the prophetic, and I love how the prophetic works. Last night, John Mark Poole was here. Incredible prophetic voice to the nations. Gave me an incredibly amazing word, and I get excited over it, but I refuse to live live my life on a prophetic word from somebody else when I have the right to hear from God for myself. We have to be after that. So Barak gets the word from the prophetess, right? And he says, here's how this will go. If you go with me, I'll go. You know why? Because he had doubt and fear and unbelief in his heart. This woman is so convinced she heard from God. Everybody follow this? In her place, she's heard from the Lord. Listen to what she actually responds to him with, because to me it's pretty exciting. Watch what it says. <laughs> and she said, I will surely go with you. Notwithstanding, the journey that you take shall not be for your honor, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Listen to what she just said. I will surely go with you. Why? Because I know what I heard. Can I tell you, when you hear straight from the Lord, faith rises inside of you. Confidence comes with that. There's a place where you've heard from God, you're willing to step into it, and you know, you know what? It, I don't care. I don't care if Sisera had 9,000 chariots. If God said he's going to deliver them into my hand, I don't care how many chariots he got. I don't care how many soldiers he got. I don't care how many. I don't care if they got nuclear bombs. God will deliver them into your hand. Well, I hope you're hearing me this morning. When you've heard from God, everything changes. So here's the deal. Deborah knows what she heard. She said, I'll surely go. I'm not intimidated at all. I'm not afraid. Barak is still in a place of fear. Everybody understand that? He wouldn't ask her to go if he's not in a place of fear. She has no fear because she's heard from God. She's a woman that's heard the Lord. Everybody catch this? And, but what did she say to him? Listen to what she said. I love what she said. She said, I'll go with you, but here's the deal. Since you're fearful and afraid... The glory of this battle is not going to you. It's going to go to a woman, right? Now, watch. If we just read that and we'd stop right there, we might all think, well, then that means she's going to get the glory and not him. But God had somebody else already lined up. Oh, I want to talk to you. I'm going to have fun with this in a little bit. Watch what happens. Sure. And Barak called Zebulon and Naphtali to Kadesh. 
and went up with 10,000 men at his feet, right? And Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, because he'd married a, a Kenite, right? And severed himself from, uh, from the Kenites and pitched his tent under the plain of Zanem, which is by Kadesh. And they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Obinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Herosheth of the Gentiles under the river of Kishon. Now, I love these verses. Watch what happens. God has this thing so set up that there's a guy who's now separated himself from the, from the Kenites. He's over here. He sees Sisera and tells Sisera, hey, this is what's going down. Barak's bringing his people together. Why? Because God in his foreknowledge already knew it was going to transpire. God in his foreknowledge already knew it was happening. And this is all being set in motion. Why? Because God is going to lure Sisera in. So when he tells Sisera what's going on, Sisera thinks, wow, now I got him right where I want him. They're trapped by the river. They're in the valley. There's no way they're going to get away. And this thing's going to go down. How many understand? And that's what's going on in Sisera's mind. This is a perfect setup for him, he thinks. How many know he was the one being set up and he didn't know it? Why? Because God wanted to move. Can I challenge you? Where does God want to move in your family? Where does God want to move in your home? When it looks like everything might be going crazy, when it looks like the odds are stacked against you, who's been there? You could look at it as, oh my goodness, we're in trouble. Or you could look at it as, oh my goodness, this is a great place for God to show up. Where's your faith? What are you ready to believe God for? Sisera is bringing his armies together against Barak. Watch what happens because I love this stuff. Okay, now watch what goes on. Okay, verse 14. And Deborah said unto Barak, up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Is not the Lord God out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. And the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. Everybody see this? I love this. <laughs> Watch. Here's what happened. It says, Deborah looks at Brock and says, this is it. This is the time up. Let's go. Let's go after this. How many know there's got to be a whole bunch of soldiers right now that are thinking, I don't know if this is such a good idea, but they've heard something. And when Deborah said, this is the time, now's the time, you know what happened? All of a sudden now the atmosphere changes. Um, I, can I tell you something? I, I'm going to talk to the women. It's Mother's Day, but let me tell you something. Your confidence will infuse your family. Your words can change the atmosphere in your house. House. Uh, at the moment that Deborah began to speak, uh, everything changed. Uh, and now Barak gets the men up and they go on a charge. And when they do, you know what it says? It says the Lord discomfited them. The Lord discomforted Sisera and all of his army. The word discomfort in the Greek means whip the fire out of. So that's what that means, okay? So here's what happened. In the midst of everything that's going on, God is on the move and now Sisera's army is being destroyed. All the chariots actually got caught in a mudslide. I won't even get into all that. There's some history on it. But what happens is, is that the chariots couldn't move. All the things were stuck and the soldiers all got killed and God was moving. And now even Sisera, who's the general, begins to run away. I love this. Why? Because a woman heard from God. Can you hear me, church? Whew. Listen, when the enemy of God is coming against your family, you have the ability to hear from God. You have the ability to speak words of life and change the atmosphere in your house. You have the ability to hear from God and change the atmosphere around you. You have the ability to hear from God. This prophetess, this judge heard from the Lord, brings an army together, and all of a sudden everything is shifting and changing. I love what's going on. Okay, so Sisera runs away. Everybody see it? And Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Herosheth of the Gentiles. And all the host of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. Yay, God. <laughs> That's a pretty big deal. Now watch what happens. Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. Everybody see it? This is good stuff. He runs. Let me read this. And Jael went out to meet Sisera, and she said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in. Turn in to me, and fear not. And when he had turned in unto her in the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink. I'm thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. 
Again, he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be that if any man comes and inquires of you and says, Is there any man here, that you would say no. Everybody catch that? Okay. He gets to the Kenites, and there's a lady there named J.L. She's a housewife. Yay. And in the midst of that, this little housewife, she sees him. She knows what's going down. She knows who he is. She says, oh, turn in here, turn in here. You can come here. And he comes in. He's been running. He's been fighting. It's a mess. He's probably cold and wet. and It's been raining. There's all kind of stuff going on. And she says, come on in the tent. And she puts a blanket on him. And he says, oh, give me a drink. Oh, here's some more milk, honey. <laughs> Woo. Some of you know the story. He lays down and goes fast asleep. Everybody see this? Now, what I love about this is this. God had this set up from the very beginning. Watch what happens. He goes fast asleep. Look at verse 21, because I love verse 21. Watch what it says. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and a hammer in her hand, and she went softly unto him and smote the nail in his temples and fastened it to the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, and so he died. Excedrin can't fix this headache. (laughs) This is is a non-fixer right here. It's all over. Picture this. She took a... Now, in the, in the Hebrew culture, in, in, in that time frame, right, in the, in the territory, it wasn't an unusual thing that actually the women set up the tents, okay? So she would have been used to some of that, and I think that's kind of interesting. So she goes out and gets a tent spike in a mallet, and while he's fast asleep, he's sleeping on his side like this. She puts the tent spike right there and drives it right through his head. I don't know if you realize or not, that'll kill you. <laughs> And it says, and so he died. Yeah, I think so. Come on. Can I talk to the church right now? She's a housewife. Okay? (laughs) Yeah, don't mess with a housewife. (laughs) If you're in a tent and someone offers you a blanket and a warm milk, no. No, no, thank you. I'm good. Stay up all night. Don't trust a woman with a mouth and a ten spike. That's the moral of the story. Listen, there's a lot more to this. What I love is, and this is what I think is exciting. Here you got a prophetess, Deborah, who's a prophetess and a judge. She has position. She has honor. She's in this high place. And then you have a housewife, right? And you know what happens? God's using one and the other. Why? Because it doesn't matter your position in life. God is able to flow through you and move through you. And what I love about JL is, She took what was at hand to be able to deliver her family from the enemy of God who has crept into her house. Oh, you don't understand. Ah, sure. There's a place where you have to understand that when God's enemies are trying to make their way into your house, you women have this opportunity to rise up and actually with whatever's at hand, you call upon God, he'll give you a strategy to bring deliverance to your family. You might have a drug addicted son. You might have a wayward daughter. You might have a husband who's, who, who's, who, who's messed up on stuff, but you know what I'm gonna tell you? It's a place for women to say, you know what? If God can use JL, he can use me. If the enemy of God is defeated by that woman, the enemy of God can be defeated by this one. And you've got to know your place. She didn't have education. She didn't have position. She didn't have a a degree hanging on the wall. She had a tent spike and a mallet. I'm much more afraid of tent spikes and mallets than I am degrees, by the way. What are you saying, Pastor? What has God put at your hand to keep the enemy away from your door? You know what? Watch what he says to her. He lays down to sleep, and what's he say to her? If anybody comes by and says, hey, is there any man here? You tell him no, right? Why? Because that's what the enemy will always do. Why? Because he wants to hide out in your house without anybody knowing it. Oh, I'm preaching now. Come on. He doesn't even want you to know who he is. I don't know if Sisera even knew that J.L. knew who he was. But I'm going to take you back to Deborah's words to Barak. Come on. When this thing goes down and Sisera's defeated, you won't get the glory. Why? Because you were fearful and afraid. 
but the glory is going to go to a woman. Did you catch that? Why? Because God in his foreknowledge had already seen what was going on. Why? Because the general was fearful and afraid, but the woman took action. Oh, I'm preaching now. Listen. The enemy's trying to find ways into your house. He's trying to find ways into your family. He's trying to find ways into your home. I think it's an amazing thing when a wife and a husband can join together and pray, grab hands and, and rebuke the devil from their family, their son, their daughter, whatever it might be. That's an amazing thing. But if dad won't do it, it's okay, mom, you still can. How do you know that? I just read JL. Come on. Didn't even, do you know it doesn't even name her uh, about her husband being anywhere around? Well, she just took matters because she understood there's a place right now where the, where the enemy has crept into our tent. Can I say something? The enemy's crept into some tents around here. And there's a place where you've got to stand in your place of authority and say, wait a minute, no more. Devil, no more. You might not have a mountain of tents baked, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> but, but I want you to know this. You've got an altar and a prayer place. You've got a closet you can climb into. You got a God that's going to move on your behalf. When I started thinking about this, I thought about Deborah's prophetic word over that whole situation. The glory is going to go to a woman. And, and you know what? God already had it set up. Nobody would have ever thought it was a little housewife in a Kenite tent. Oh. Whew. There's a place where the women of God are called to arise. I find more and more that glass ceiling is being shattered in the church. I find more and more where God is raising up women and they're standing in their place. I thought about the Raw Conference that took place a couple of weeks ago over in Gettysburg. Do you know that what they did in Gettysburg, they've now been invited to do in New York, Florida, Virginia, and Jamaica. I think that's amazing. Why? Because women have to understand they're in a place to be empowered right now. And God is simply saying, women, would you arise? I am incredibly encouraged. Listen to me. There's never a place where you overstep, and I think everybody understands that. There's never a place where you overstep, but you do step into your place. There's a, you purpose in your heart. I'm stepping into my place. I'm stepping into my place. I, I, I don't even know what it looks like yet, but all I'm saying is, God, I'm available and you can use me. And if there's an enemy in my house, give me the wisdom to drive that enemy out. Uh, I, I challenge you, church. There's a place of saying, uh, it, can I step into that? Can I rise into that place where God's ordained for me? Because over and over, these are the things that speak to me. It's a time for empowering women and fulfilling purpose. Uh, and you might say, well, pastor, I don't even know what my purpose is. That's all right. What's your passion? If you can't find your purpose, find your passion. What's your passion? What are you passionate about? And go after that with everything that's inside of you. When I think about the women that God is raising up, when I think about what God is doing, when I think about, about how the church is, is moving forward in this hour, and it's the most exciting time ever in the history of the world, I find God meeting with women and calling them into a higher place. One of the most heroic women I've ever had the opportunity to meet is a lady named Heidi Baker. And you know that in ministry, she had struggled and struggled and struggled, but she had a divine encounter with God in an amazing place. It was in the Toronto outpouring, if some of you are familiar with what that was all about, but she encountered God in an amazing way. And she went back and her and her husband, you know what they did? They sold everything they had. And with a few dollars, they moved to a foreign country in Mozambique. And they started a ministry called Iris Ministries. But today, from what I can gather, from what I could gather in the latest reports, they're feeding 18,000 orphans a day. Do you know how incredible that is? No, 18,000 orphans. That's like, that's ridiculous. Small, small towns don't have 18,000 people. What are you saying? Because a woman wasn't afraid to step into a place that God had called her, even though she didn't understand how it might even be possible or work. Why? Because God won't give you something that you can do. He'll give you something you have to stretch to make happen. Boy, I hope that makes sense. Whew. Say, Pastor, that doesn't sound easy. No, if it was easy, anyone could do it. It's going to take people of faith. It's going to take people that believe God. It's going to take people that actually say, you know what? I'm not afraid to be stretched. God, what do you want to do? How do you want to do that? What's it going to look like? 
Deborah speaks to a general. I want you to get the picture of this. She's a prophetess and a judge. She is the leader in Israel, but she's not a military person. Most of your judges that you read about went into battle. Deborah, Deborah assists in the battle, but doesn't lead in the battle. Does that make sense? In that place, she goes with Barak for, for, can I say this, for moral support because he was too afraid to do it on his own. What would it look like? Now watch, when she steps into that role, this got to be a challenging thing because this wasn't something that was normal to the culture of the day, to have a woman prophetess. And uh, I'm sorry, there was women prophets, but there wasn't women judges. But she steps into that place because God has ordained her for such a time as this. I think about some of the great women and we could have easily preached today on Esther and how she stepped into her place. And we could have talked about Ruth and how she stepped into her place. And we could have talked about even New Testament like Aquila, Aquila, his wife was Priscilla. But Priscilla is a major speaker into the life of a guy named Apollos and it's an incredible story and I don't have time to go into all that. Even the lady at the woman of the well leads a revival in John chapter four to a group of people from Samaria who weren't even ready for the gospel as far as dispensation went, but because God moved in such a miraculous way that something happened and they reached into a dispensation ahead of their time. Why? Because a woman wasn't afraid anymore. And you understand, can I say this? Let me teach you something real quick. In John chapter four, when the woman comes to the well, you know that she came at noon? Does everybody catch that? If you catch this, the woman comes to the, to the well at noon and when she comes to the well at noon, you know what happens? You gotta know this. When she comes there at noon time, she's, not, she's there, no one else should even be there. Why? Women didn't gather water at noon. They gathered water early in the morning from about eight to nine o'clock. They gathered water in the evening from about four to five and at noon she went there. Why? Why did she go at noon? Because she was afraid about what everybody was saying about her. She had been married five times and now she's living with a guy that's the sixth one on, on uh, she's got his eye on him. Does everybody follow that? So she's got a bad reputation in town. All the voices are speaking against her and she's in a place of really trying to just sneak in and sneak out without anybody knowing. When she sees Jesus, she's not even thinking he's gonna talk to her. Why? Because he's a Jewish man and no Jewish man is gonna speak to a Samaritan woman. She thinks she's safe. But then he begins to speak to her. They're in a city called Sychar. It's the well of Jacob. And you know what happens? She drops her water pot, runs back into town, and starts screaming out loud, come and see a man who told me all things ever I did. Is not this the Christ? She's excited. For whatever reason, her influence now touches the city. Why? because she was a woman who used to hide, but now stepped into her place. <clears throat> when she stepped into her place, it turned the whole town upside down. Jesus was only planning on passing through. He said, I must needs pass through Samaria, but he ends up staying two more days, teaches in their village, and revival breaks out in John chapter four. This is amazing. Why? Because after the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's a move in Jerusalem, but you know where the next move is? Samaria. Why? Because the seeds that were planted in John chapter 4 began to blossom in Acts chapter 8. Why? Because a woman stepped into her place. She came out of her place of hiding and stepped into her role. Uh, Brian, Brian, Brian Simmons, who wrote the Message Bible, actually did all the research on what the lady's name was, her history, and all the things that go with that. She became an amazing woman of God, who even her children, and she, and she suffered through pain and torture, but she wouldn't deny Christ, and God used her. Even soldiers were getting turned around because she continued to speak the name of Jesus. It's, it's so exciting when we stop and we think about women who aren't afraid anymore, but they're saying, you know what? I'm gonna step into my place. I hear what the Lord's speaking. I hear what God's saying and they feel empowered. But the only way that can happen is that you have to hear from God. Deborah heard from God, right? JL knew exactly what to do. How does she know that? Something has to move on her. When the enemy of God comes into your tent, I'm gonna tell you something. You need to hear from God. The entire future of the church, the entire future of our country, the entire future of the world hinges on our ability to hear God. We have got to hear him. In this day and age, there's never been a time like this. You need to hear from God right now. Man, I believe that. What's God want to do in your house? What's God want to do in your tent? What enemy has crept into your tent unawares 
that if you don't hear from God could bring destruction, but if you hear from God, everything changes. What are you ready? Because if we don't tune our ears to hear him, we're in trouble. But if we hear him, oh my goodness, everything changes. When Deborah heard from the Lord, 20 years of oppression changed. Who hears me? Come on, church. When J.L. heard from the Lord, the enemy is defeated. <laughs> Come on. Oh. Even, e- even, the, even the lady at the well, right? The woman at the well in, Acts, or in, in, in John 4 heard a direct word from Jesus, but a whole town gets turned. I could t- walk you through over and over all the amazing things that happened because women heard God. And I, I got to say this. It's Mother's Day. And I'm talking directly to women. Men, we're still called to be in a place where we lead in our homes. Come here, man. I I will tell you this. I've watched God work in my wife over the years. I'll step down. You can step up and we'll be on the same place. Okay. (laughs) This is good. (laughs) I've watched God work in my wife. Now, in the midst of that, what I find is this that oftentimes I feel like I'm hearing from the Lord, right? I want to hear from God. And sometimes I'm moving in a direction, and she'll say to me, have you prayed about this? Because I'm hearing this. And I'm like, stink. (laughs) But I don't want to tell her because I want her to think I'm still leading. (laughs) But there's a place where, watch, I realize that God brings her into my life, right? Come on. Even even if we look at this, do you realize I'm going to really, can I mess with your theology for a minute? If you actually start to read in Genesis chapter 2 when God creates Adam, right? It talks about the creation of Adam because he creates Adam in Genesis 1. But he describes that creation in Genesis chapter 2. And when he does, he says, at the end of chapter 1, it actually says, male and female created he him. Right? That's a pre- Hold on. Oh, Dave, what are you doing? He's, ta- he's talking about empowering women right now. <laughs> so, so, but watch, stay with me for just a second because I want you to see this. In the midst of all that, what we find is that, 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 that when, we're, when we're in that place and she's hearing from the Lord, here's what happens. I got to stop. You know why? Because God gave me her for a reason. She's a help me to me to hear. So when I'm hearing from God, I love when I'm hearing, let's go left and she's hearing, let's go left. Where's the confusion come? If I'm hearing, let's go left and she's hearing, let's go right, what happens? <laughs> we pray <laughs> and then we go right okay, so, okay, okay. But, but, but the reality of that is is that there's a purpose for that how many of you know I, mean, I might shock you but women think different than men none of you knew that huh <laughs> okay but, but there's a reason for all that. And as we stop and we see this, here's the deal. is that God brings us these help meets into our lives that, that, that together we can work as one, right? Because didn't Jesus say the two become one, right? Come on. I do this in premarital counseling all the time. I talk to them about, listen, man, the, on the day that you stand before the altar, you have to understand something. The two of you become one. And then for the rest of your life, the battle's over which one. But anyway, <laughs> so, so, but, but here's the reality of that. When you come together in that place, there's something about, and, and, and God moves, and God will speak to her in ways different than he speaks to me. And it's okay. But the challenge that, we're, that we deal with is this. When we can come together and pray and hear God collectively together, we know what the Lord's wanting to do. Unfortunately, in the body of Christ, not every woman has a man that wants to hear from God. Not every man has a woman that wants to hear from God. But when you do, there can be amazing things. But if one drops out of the picture, the other still has to pursue God. Why? How many understand this? 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says that if I'm an unbelieving husband, the Bible says she can stay and walk chaste before God. And what's it say? The unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Right? There's a place where her walk with God, modeled out in love, walking this thing out in sincerity and truth, places a draw on my heart and gives Holy Spirit something to continually work with to draw me to him. Does that make sense? That's exactly what he's saying right there. But there's a place where she has to stand in her place. I have to stand in my place. If if she refuses to stand in her place, I still got to stand in my place. Does that make sense? So there's a place where we're still walking this thing out in sincerity no matter what's going on around us. But both of us, and this is what I'm trying to tell us, both of us have the incredible ability to hear God. Barak was a general who should have heard God but didn't, and Deborah had to hear God. 
But when Deborah heard God, she spoke to Brack. He still didn't want to hear, right? So he said, the only way I'm going is if you go because I don't know that I can do this. But if you're going, if you're brave enough to go, then I believe you actually did hear God. If you're not brave enough to go, maybe you didn't hear God and you're just trying to send me to my death. So he holds back. And she said, because you don't hear God, that's really what she's saying. The glory of this battle is going to go to a woman who does. And J.L. ends up here in the Lord taking, taking Sisera out. Does everybody follow that? We have this incredible ability to hear God. I believe with everything inside of me today this. I believe that God is empowering women in the body of Christ. The glass ceiling has been shattered. And women are rising up and taking a place. But here's the challenge that I have for you is, what are you doing to hear God? And I want to say it. You have a place where you can get alone. I love this. Can I share this with you? I'm going to get a little personal. But maybe over the last five years, I've watched this woman who's the mother of our house. I, I'll, I'll get up and maybe I'll do some things in the morning. When I come home, I'll come to the house and, and she's in the, in, in on, on, the, on the love seat and she's got a blanket over her and she's got her Bible in her hand and a cup of coffee right there and she's pursuing God with all of her heart. She's praying. She comes to me. She talks to me about praying for our kids and praying for our grandchildren and praying for the church family and special needs that are going on. And, and, and she's talking to me about these kind of things and she's pursuing the Lord with all of her heart. You know what it does to me? It raises my confidence in her. When it raises my confidence in her and she says, this is what I'm hearing from the Lord, I usually go, whatever. And then I go pray and say, okay, God, she's right. <laughs> okay, but, but, but in that place, I'm finding that God is moving more and more. Why? Because she's setting herself up to hear him. Please hear what I just said. If you want to hear from God, you're going to have to set yourself up to hear him. If you want to know the secrets of heaven, get in the secret place. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I'll say of the Lord, he's my refuge, my strength, my God, in whom I trust. Is there a time when you're setting yourself up to hear God? Why? Because you need to hear God now more than you ever have. Why? Because we're closer. Things are happening. Everything's spinning, and we have to hear God. The, the, the challenge that we're faced with right now is that the body of Christ right now in this hour has a greater need to hear God and lead the country. The church, we have a divided country. How can the church lead a divided country if it's a divided church? But if collectively we're all hearing God, then we can move forward in the same place. We have this incredible ability to hear the Lord. I challenge the church. Let's hear him together. I challenge you ladies, get in the secret place, hear God. If your husband or your spouse isn't where he needs to be, your job is to pray and believe God and continue to stay in that place. The, it, it, I don't know what it'd be like. I've never had to live with an unsaved spouse. I don't know what that looks like. I can imagine what it looks like, but I've never experienced it. But I can tell you this, man, all I can do is encourage you in what the word of God says is you keep pressing, you keep believing, you keep standing, you keep staying. You, you, you pray and you stay and you believe God and you strengthen and you walk and you, and you bombard heaven with everything you can and believe that God's going to move. Church, I believe this with all my heart today. God's calling us to hear him. Stand with me. Thanks. Did you want to share something? Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> okay, gotcha. <laughs> There's something about you and I hearing God. There's something about us hearing the Lord. Let me ask you this question. I start so many of my classes. What are you hearing from the Lord? It's Mother's Day. What are you hearing for your family? What are you hearing? What's God speaking? What's God saying? What's God doing in your life? Deborah stepped into her destiny. She stepped into her purpose. JL stepped into her destiny. She stepped into her purpose. What are you hearing from the Lord? What's your purpose? What are you stepping into? What are you ready to believe God for? Is there a place where you're saying, God, I need you. God, I want you. God, I long for you. God, I desire you with all my heart. Are you ready? Church, I believe this is that hour right now. I'm going to ask you to do something a little strange today. And I know it's, it's Mother's Day, but I want you to do something just a little different. Would you just put one of your hands on one of your ears? And the other hand on your heart. Do you know why I say that? That's so mechanical. I almost hate the mechanical stuff.
but I just heard the Lord saying, these are the two places we hear God. We hear him in our ear and we hear him in our heart. Are you ready? Are you ready to believe the Lord? Are you ready to hear God? Are you ready to believe God moving in your life right now? Are you saying, God, I so want to hear you. I want to know you. Holy Spirit, I thank you. I'm asking you to come and empower us. Come and draw us. Come, God, open our ears that we might hear. Open our hearts to hear the voice of the Lord speaking to us, individually and corporately. God, we need to hear you. We need to know you. This is an exciting time, perhaps the most exciting time ever in the history of the world. And I'm asking you, God, help us to hear you. Help us to know you. Help us to see you more than we ever have before. Help us to be so consciously aware, God, of your presence every moment of our life. I'm asking you, God, speak to us and that we might hear. Draw us near to your heart. Help us to know you more, God. God, that we might hear the secrets of heaven. God, that we might hear your voice in the sweet night watches. God, that you would speak to us and draw us nearer to you. Help us to know you. Help us to love you. Help us, God, to be empowered in all that you've called us to do. Father, I thank you. I just bless the women of this house right now. God, I thank you for an empowerment culture. And I speak blessing and favor over the women. That they would rise up and actually step into their place. And Father, they wouldn't feel restricted or constrained. But God, that they would be saying, Jesus, uh, we're going to step into our destiny. We're We're going to step into the fulfillment of purpose. We're going to believe you, God, for the more that you have for us. And I'm asking your blessing, your favor, your help, your strength. Bless these women, I pray, God. Let them step into purpose. Let them step into their passion. Let them flow into things of God. May the blessing of the Lord rest upon them in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. I I just feel so good about just really challenging us to step into our destiny. Have an amazing Mother's Day. God bless you. Hug somebody. You can be dismissed. Thanks for being with us. Check